Emilio, the Honey Badger, Urutia! Yo, 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 ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Honey Badger Hour. All the way from down under, we got the big dog, Joe Lopez. Thanks for having me on, Emily. Always a pleasure to catch up with you, brother. Hey, we really appreciate the time, Big Joe. It's been a while, but this is not your first rodeo on the Honey Badger Hour. Done a few. Woo! I love it, man. Yo, I know it was a good year when I got to see you guys twice, so I know we're, we're doing good. Yeah, yeah, it was last year, yeah? Oh, yeah, last year, but we're just we're just fresh into the year. 2022, we, 2022 was a great year, I would safe to say, huh? Yeah, it was, it was. Uh, built on a lot of memories again, you know? Always good to catch up. Yeah, definitely. And it was a good bounce back for you guys, huh? You were able to stay busy with the gym and stuff, get the boys get rolling again. It's nice to see the champ back yeah. in action. Yeah, well, he likes to keep active and, uh, you know, we've only got this short window to, you know, to make all your money and get all your fights in. So you've got to take advantage of it. You can't sit there on the sideline, you know, waiting for it. You've got to go out and take it. I think that you guys are really setting a precedent right now on the work ethic and, like, uh, really paving the way for the rest of the fighters now to see how champs are supposed to and act and how to go get things done in the UFC because uh, you guys are kind of trailblazing it right now with the uh, man going to Abu Dhabi, making weight. How was the experience going to Abu Dhabi with everybody? Yeah, it was good. You know, um, I've been to Abu Dhabi a few times. Uh, you know, we had the Fight Island and I've also worked there a couple of times. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it was hot. But it was, um, yeah, it was good. Yeah, do you good think? Experience. Do you think that's what helped plant the seed for for the super fight between Volk and Makachev? Now he always wants the hard way. He doesn't, you know, throughout his career, you know, you know, when we were coming up through the amateurs and even when we were in the pros, you know, we we're trying to get as many fights up as possible. And I'd say, you know, let's take one easy fight, and he, he'd never take the easy one. He'd always want the hardest fight. You know, it's just not in his DNA. He just likes to take the hard road. Which is good. It builds character, and you know, for me, it wasn't about taking the easy fights. It's just sometimes when you want to get the the numbers up, it's good to have a hard fight than have an easy fight, you know. And uh, still getting that um, cage time in there. But you know, Alex just you know he he didn't want a bar of it. He just wants the hard fights. Wow. Hey, that's a pretty. Do you find that as a rarity for for athletes? Whereas in most, I mean, you could probably see it. You see, do you see you you see a lot where athletes have um. Some athletes will try to take the path of least resistance to maybe get to the highest level, which is not the worst route, right? Like, that, you call that more the boxing way? Yeah, it is. Uh, that follows a lot of the boxing way. But look, at the end of the day, they're going to get exposed. To me, it's just the wear and tear on the body while you're getting the numbers up, you know, before we got to, to the UFC, you know. It was just, like I said, just trying to get fights in, in in a short amount of time as possible without the injuries, you know. Because you you know yourself, it's it's such it's so easy to get hurt, you know, and it's so easy to overtrain. So you've got to find that happy balance. But you know, Alex has always wanted no easy way. You know, he's always wanted the hard way. Yeah, that's which is good because, like I said, when it, when it comes to the big show and the big fights, yeah, he's been there a hundred times. You know, not only there physically but mentally. You know, uh, and, and it shows a lot of these guys that take the easy way. As soon as they get to some sort of hard fight or a bit of adversity, they, they fall apart and it shows. Yeah, definitely. That's very true, man. But um, you made a good point about the – it's just a fine line between the wear and tear and just not getting injured, something silly, right? Because you can go into a fight and anything can happen. Sometimes a guy goes in there, they get the knockout quick, and they come back out and their elbow's all messed up. They don't even know what happened. And, and, and I mean, I think most fighters go into a fight with some sort of niggly little injury. Sometimes – Worse sometimes, not so bad, but you know, fight camps are brutal. You know, you, you know that it, it is hard. You know, just the, the constant training. I, I think at the moment we've got a really good sort of balance on what we're doing with our training. You know, um, and it's it's worked the last four fights, and um, yeah, it's going good. Yeah, have you guys? Do you more or less for for the training camp, right? Do you change? Does, do you change the sessions based on the person you're fighting, more or less, or does the basic like do you have like a blueprint that stays the same, and then you have some sessions that you can switch and tweak up? Blueprint's the same, you know. We we try and do, uh, you know, a technical session and a, a live hard session, you know, it, 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 with each, you know, during the day, 
Uh, you know, sometimes we might do you know, two or three technical. Or, it, we probably train less in fight camp, but the intensity is a lot, a lot more. You know, so I expect those workouts to you go in there and give it your hundred percent. You know, like we could train eight hours, but h- how is the body gonna? You're not going to give a hundred percent to each of those sessions that you're going to do over those eight hours. So. What I try and do is with those live sessions, I keep them, you know, an hour, hour and a half, and, and they're, they're very physical. But we, um, yeah, then, then we do a technical session later in the afternoon, you know, so the body gets time to rest, you know, and then we'll probably do another technical session in the morning, and then we'll probably go live again in the afternoon. Um, but yeah, that, that that's the sort of structure I've been um, doing for the last, oh, I'd say, four or five fights. And, and yeah, his body's just recovering, and he's feeling a lot better. You know, a lot of the times there earlier on, we, he, he was being a, he was a little bit cooked sometimes. You know, just with the overtraining, and just Alex himself. You know, Alex just doesn't want to. Yeah, he, I mean, the first couple of UFC fights, he wanted he, in his head. He said he had to keep doing what we were doing at home. So we were doing two two live sessions every more every, you know in the morning, one in the evening because that's what we were doing at home and he wanted to stay in that same mindset that we were at home and didn't want uh, to be phased by, you know, the bright lights of the UFC. He wanted to keep the same he, he wanted to keep the same the same training regime all the way till fight day, all the way till he's till he steps on the mat, till he steps in the cage. Yeah, exactly. And it took me such a long time to to get him out of that, you know, cuz I'd say look some guys fight work don't even do anything, you know. Yeah, some guys yeah, just like they, to like re- turn it off right week. Yeah, yeah, they, they you know they recover their body, and, and look at the moment, you know, we're like I said, we've got a really good schedule. It's working well on his body; he's recovering really well. Um, so it's it, you know it is working. You know what we've been doing, uh, and the results speak for themselves. Um, yeah, he, I mean, I'd, I'd get there sometimes, and he, I could just see that he was starting to get to that point where he was nearly overtraining and. I always say, you know, overtraining is worse than undertraining, you know, because you can always get fitter and stronger. But once you overtrain, you've got to get your body to reset itself and get back there. And that takes longer, you know. Yeah, overtraining can be super detrimental. And a lot of times, sometimes when you overtrain, when you get into the fight, you're like, sometimes the fighter's already had his biggest fight in the training where he's like almost like, um, it's, yeah, it's almost harder. Yeah, they already went all, they're almost burnt out by the time the, the fight starts. Well, well, it's you know, it's uh, th- that's the way it is. It's uh, your body uh, cooks itself, and then you got you you you've got to rest, and it's got to rebuild itself. You know, if you understand a bit of how the body works, you know, you, you, you know, I always use the example. You know, sometimes less is more. You know, because the body, when, when you train, you're you're tearing your muscles in a good way, and then they, when you rest, they rebuild themselves. Now, if you keep tearing those muscles over and over and over. They don't rebuild. You end up getting weaker and weaker. And I, I've seen that firsthand a lot of times with guys. You know, um, they just want to do that a little bit more and a little bit more. And yeah, you know, like I say, sometimes less is more. So you got to find that balance of you know the technical and the live and everything else. And then it's really important to have good training partners. You know, if you if you're in a gym where everybody wants to kill you and everybody wants to prove themselves better than you, well. Honestly, the gym's going to go nowhere. You know, we're we're a team. We all work together, and we're, you know, we're all trying to get better together. You know. Yeah, definitely. That's one of the things about um, Alex. That's what I love now that he kind of like set the precedent too. Because you go to a lot of gyms and you have like a lot of the a lot of like the top guys. They'll be just beating up on everybody, and then the other the, some of the guys coming up, they think that's just the way it is. They're supposed to get brain damaged by their UFC teammates. But that's like, and then it's like, I don't know, man. I train with the best in the world, and. They take care of their partners, you know, so it's kind of funny. Like, he said, they, the boys there, they kind of set the precedent on how to – and they really kind of showed me a, a, the way because I always thought you had to train. You had, That's how you had to train. I thought it was just, oh, these guys are high level. You got to do it like that, you know? Yeah, and, and same as the sparring, you know. I, I, I don't believe in hard sparring, you know. I, I always say, you know, you probably go, you know, between seven and eight. Sometimes you go to a nine, but you never want to go to ten. I always go, if you're going to go to ten, you might as well have a five. You know, risk reward. It just it's it's not worth it. And like you said, you know, the guys that are up and coming. How are they going to get better if you're just putting a beat down every time that you spar them? So 
you, you've got to work together. And don't get me wrong, you, you, you've got to, um, you know, if, it, if it's your turn on the block, you know, you're fighting. Um, obviously, it's all about you. So, you know, the guys that are with you, that they work with you to, you know, they're, they're not going to try and bring you down or hurt you uh, to uh, make themselves think that they're better than you, you know. And, and that's what I'm saying about our team environment. And if you go to any of the really good gyms, which I've been lucky enough to have trained at, you know, that, that's the way they spar, you know. Um, you've got to look after each other. You can't you can't go in there, you know. Yeah, yeah. Even just leg kicks, if, you know, I'm leg kicking the, the shit out of your leg, the next day you're not going to be able to move around because, you you know, I might have walked your thigh or, or your calf and then what are you going to do, you know? You've got to limp around for a couple of weeks before it gets better. And it's not worth it. Yeah, I never thought about that. That's true, man. You get leg kicked a few times and then you can't walk for three days. And if you're in the middle of fight camp, you went four days without being really to get a productive training session because somebody was trying to cook your legs up. It's crazy. Yeah, exactly. And then it's, you know, the, again, uh, the, the, the head trauma, you know, getting hit in the head all the time. It, it's, it's no good, you know. Um, I always go, you don't want to be my age and you can't remember your kids' names and you know, you, you, you're scattered because you've been hit too many times in your, in your younger days, you know. And some guys are too tough for their own good and they, they need good coaches to pull them up and, and, and keep it there, you know. that Like I said, you know, seven to, you know, maybe a nine sometimes, you know. And, and nine, I usually leave it to guys that are inexperienced. Sometimes I like them to let somebody go a little bit harder on them so when they do get into the fight, they're not shocked by the idea of some guy trying to take their head off, but as a general rule, we don't we don't spar that hard, you know. And, and it saves the injuries as well. Yeah, all the big injuries are always going to come from sparring, and it's also important yeah. that the guys don't have ego, especially for the training partners of the high level guys too, because you don't want an up and comer trying to you know get one up on the guy, so he say he can say he can got one up on the champ, you know, and then ends up hurting him or something like this. It's just it works both ways. It's super dangerous, you know. Exactly, exactly. That, that's why in camp, you know, you usually got to surround yourself with a, a group, a group, a core group of guys that you know and trust, and they're they're not there for themselves. They're there for the team, and you know, at the end goal is whoever's fighting. You know, uh, you know, he, he gets he gets to get his hand raised. You know, and and then the next time it's the other guy's turn, every, everybody reciprocates and everybody works together for that guy to get his hand raised. Yeah, it's the best way for the team environment to, to grow together, I reckon. Yeah. Do you guys have a little squad? Do you guys have a little squad right now built up for Volk right now, getting ready for for the camp? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, Frankie's here. Craig gets here tomorrow. Brad's here. Jamie Malarkey's here. Plus all the guys from the gym, you know. We've got a lot of good up, up, up and coming guys that are, you know, just probably on the, on the cusp of, you know, getting – getting the call up so we've got a good little team here you know oh wow that sounds like a, oh and brad is already in is brad already is brad's already in yeah, town brad, yeah brad had to leave for a couple of days but he's back today and you know brad's always good to have around you know he's you know knowledge of striking and yeah and he, he's a lot more relaxed now you know now he uh, you know he's yeah he's, he's in a good place at the moment so it was good to see him happy for a change which yeah. is very rare <laughs> oh man, that's awesome! Yeah, and how's Frankie doing? How's how's Frankie getting along in uh, in Wollongong? You got Frankie down man, in the gong. The, they let him in. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's the Lord Mayor now. He's, he's the Lord Mayor. He's taken over. Yeah, he's <laughs> he's got an ID. He's got an ID for what? He's got an Australian ID. No, he can he can pop in. He's got a, a register. Yeah, he's got a, he's got an email. He's got a mail address in Australia. Frank Frankie, he's the chameleon. If he goes to to Russia, he's Russian. If he goes to, you know, Tonga, he's a Toko. If he goes over <laughs> to Samoa, he's a Lusa. He's he's everywhere, man. <laughs> Frankie's a chameleon. He fits in anywhere. He's a he's a crack up, Frankie. Hey, hell, man. Hey, what a great and he's gonna. He's probably got the same body frame. He looks about the same height, frame size as uh, Makachev. So it's a good. He does. It's, he's it's a good replication. Yeah. Long. Yeah, he's very long, and yeah, you know, he's. His wrestling's always on point, you know, and he always puts his body on the line. That's all you got to love about Frankie, you know. He's just there day in, day out, you know, putting his body on the line, you know. I was thinking. Around, 
he must be in tremendous shape. I'm always thinking, I'm like, yo, he's a professional, just a body. Yo. It's amazing. It's it's kind of tremendous, man. It's kind of cool looking back now. You know, I'm like, wow, man, f- to see him. Yeah, yeah it's, it's cool, man. I love seeing it. I love seeing all you guys, man. And this, the whole connection that stayed together, right? You have a real synergy, man, that I don't know. How, it's going to be hard. Yeah, it's, it's pretty magical to see from the outside in too, you know? You guys have yeah. been having the same crew for a while. Yeah, we have. You know, like um, even the corner, you know, me as a head coach, I've I got to find the best guys that are, you know, going to make, you know, not only Alex, but all my fighters work, you know. And, you know, we've got that good, um, you know, the good relationship with the guys at, you know, City Kickboxing. Um, you know, I help them out. They help me out. Uh, you know, they help me corner. I help them corner. You know, Hugh is probably one of the best cornermen in the world, you know, without a doubt. It's always good to have him there, his knowledge and uh, his, you know, what would you say, you know, you know, his eye for detail is really, really good. Um, and, you know, it's, it's always good, you know, and not only that, we're good friends as well. Yeah, it's awesome, man. And then you got Craig Jones coming down. He's coming in for the camp. He's going to be helping you guys. How long is he going to be in Australia for? Um, he's going to be here till we head to Perth. Oh, nice. He was here for a few weeks. He was here for about... Oh, I, I don't know, two or three weeks, and then he had to head back to the States to sort some stuff out, and now he's back again, uh, and he'll be here for the next three weeks. And oh, you know, that's he's, awesome. You know, you've rolled with him. You know what he's like. He's uh, he's a beast on the mat. Um, again, as a coach, and and his uh, eye for detail, and he's. Um, you know, breaking things down is, you know, second to none, you know. That's why he's probably one of the best guys. And he's always good to have around, you know. I, I really uh, like bouncing ideas off him and seeing what his thoughts are. And, yeah, it's, it's, it's really good to have him part of the team. Oh, yeah, what a treat for the students, right? They got the man, they get to train with the pound for pound. They got to train with maybe the number one, the number two jiu-jitsu guy in the world and the number one MMA fighter yeah. in the world, all in in, 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 in Wollongong, Australia, man. Not not too shabby for freestyle fighting gym, uh, no. Big Joe. And, and, and <laughs> we train at the old uh, church, you know, it was a church, and now I, I turned it into a gym. And, you know, it, uh, you know, sometimes I have to pinch myself and think, geez, look what came out of this little church, you know? It's amazing. Yeah. It's yeah. amazing looking That's back, man. What a journey, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It, um, yeah, it's 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 pretty amazing, you know. And yeah, yeah to be surrounded by you know some of these top martial artists is so good. Yeah, it's good. How's the do you guys have a do you how's the MMA scene in, in Wollongong now? Has it been picking up a lot more? Or do you guys have a few shows that you that you got do you got your guys going to and competing throughout the region? Uh, look, there's always shows in Australia. I, I try and do one. Last year I did two shows. Um, it usually takes me 12 months to get over it, you know. <laughs> to get over it's a lot of stress. It's a lot of hassle dealing with a show. Yeah, oh, look, the matchmaking is more than anything, you know. When you're putting, you know, you, you think you've got your card sorted and then all of a sudden people pull out and you've got to rematch them. And you feel bad for, you know, somebody that's, you know, done eight weeks and a week or two weeks out somebody pulls out on them and then you've got to try and, you know, rematch them. That, that's a bit of a hate. And it's mainly because it's out of my hands, you know. Yeah. It's, it's in the, the other somebody else's hands and that's what stresses me out. Where The show itself is easy, you know. You make a few calls. I've done that many of them. And it's, it's not that hard, you know. But the, the matchmaking is the one that stresses me out, you know. And like I said, more, more, for, more sake for the, the fighters, you know. I feel for them, you know. Like you, you've trained for – eight weeks, ten weeks, and you, you, you're at the, the pointy end of the, you know, and you're just about to fight and the guy pulls out, and you, you know, you've sold tickets, you've got, you're so excited for it and then you can't get a match up, you know. Yeah, that's got to be rough. Yeah. And then for you to get the news when the guy messages you and tells you I'm out, you got to just be like, son of a, you know, it's kind of really, bo- yeah. I bet you it's got, I would be, I can imagine, man. <laughs> yeah. And look, I, I understand if someone gets hurt, but, Sometimes I call it the heart lids, you know, the, the heart goes, you know, they start starts getting closer and it's usually like that last week they start thinking, going, shit, I'm actually going to get in the cage with someone and, and they get scared and they back out, you know. that's They're the ones that hurt me the most, you know. Yeah, oh my gosh, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And you kind of, yeah, you kind of get the feeling too. You kind of know when the guy's going to, you know, like you're like, ah, son of a bitch, I knew he was going to do it. <laughs> Yeah, well, they, they call them. Well, the other ones you get are the the poster fighters. You know, they uh, 
they say, yes, yes, yes. As soon as they get their, you got a poster of them with their, you know, that they're going to fight, all of a sudden they drop out. I got a friend who did that in Thailand. I know a guy here in Miami. He came, he came to Thailand. He got his name on the poster. He pulled out, took the poster back home. He's got it up in his gym crew. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. I've, I've seen that before. There was a guy. Someone said to me, this guy's had about eight fights. I go, mate, he's only had one. <laughs> go, no, no, no. I've seen all this stuff. And I go, mate, he's been on eight posters. He's only ever had one fight. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're poster fighters, you know. They just... They, they they like everyone to think of them as fighters, but you know when push comes to shove, you know they they're not there for the push. <laughs> yeah, what do you do as a coach? Oh, so how about as a coach when you get these guys in the gym? Because I'm sure you get a lot of them that come to the gym, right? They want to train, and then I guess, but it's like they're kind of a paying member. So how do you? I wonder how you treat that a paying member towards somebody who you kind of know is bullshitting, but they, you're just like ah, oh, this guy's paying. I just let it ride. <laughs> uh, well, usually they get found out, you know, because I always say to them. And I always go, if you give me your time, I will let you go into the cage. So you've got to give me a couple of months that you're serious about this. So you've got to show up for every session for a couple of months or a month if you're fit. And, and then if, if you prove to me that you're serious about it, I'll put you in camp. And then I don't care whether they win, lose or draw. But those guys always get exposed in the sparring and in the training sessions because – we do have a lot of sessions there that, you know, are meant to break you, you know, and <clears throat> that's where they, they they fall off, you know. And, and sometimes, I, like someone said to me, they go, you know, that guy's not up to scratch. And I go, yeah, but, you know, I, I told him if you put the time in, I, I, did, I don't care whether he won, you know, won, lost or draw. He gave, me, he gave me all his time. He put the best effort he could in and I'm proud of him anyway, you know, because... Some guys are just not built to be fighters, but in their head they, they want to give it a go. And I just if, – if they put that time in, I'll give them their time, you know? Yeah, definitely. I think for you it's uh, it's about the effort. You don't got to be the best guy. You don't got to be the number one guy in the class tapping everybody out. But if you want to compete and you work hard and you do your best, you're going to give them the opportunity to go out there and do and put put it out there. 100%. You know, that, that that's the way. You know, a lot of coaches just want – you know, to win, 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 you know, but I, I like to win as well, you know, but if somebody wants to do it and they're really serious about it and they put that time in, I've got to give them their time, you know. It's just, uh, you know, ethically I've got to do that. That's just me, you know. Other guys don't. Uh, I mean, look, there's some guys there I've just said, man, you, you're going to struggle, you know. <laughs> there's one guy there in particular <laughs> who uh, – he came to the gym and he was the most uncoordinated guy. <clears throat> he'd tell him to go left, he'd go right, you'd point left and he'd still go right. He just couldn't get anything together. But he was super fit, he was super strong and he got to his fight and I just said to him, look, mate, you're fit, you're strong. <laughs> I just want you to just go forward and just don't stop punching and kicking. And he ended up winning the fight, you know, and then – he got so excited, he come back to, you know, to the gym next week and said, uh, well, I'm ready for my next one. I said, I want you to replay and watch your fight and then you tell me when you're ready <laughs> because, you know, he, he just got by with his athleticism, you know, and he overwhelmed the guy, which was, yeah. And this the guy that he fought ended up being a, ended up being a champion, but his first fight was a loss to my guy who was uh, – Totally unco, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that put that put the and then it made him a champion, so it kind of lit a fire under the other guy's ass, you know. Exactly. Yeah. No, but that's good. That's true, man. If somebody puts in the effort and they want to work hard and they want to put it in, because it's a great experience and you learn a lot about yourself. If you go out there and you compete and you prepare for a, a fight and you train really hard and you make the weight, it's a good feeling. When you know, win or lose, if you do your best, it's a, it's a good. It's very rewarding afterwards. 100%. And you face your fear, and I'm all about facing your fear, you know. Uh, uh, if you if you face that fear, you become a, a better, stronger person inside. And, you know, sometimes these people need that. And, you know, if, if I'm the, the one that, you know, the vehicle that drives them there, well, I, I'm the one, you know. Where I know some coaches, they just want winners, you know. They don't want to lose. They, they uh, what would you call it, you know. They, like they don't want, want to lose hate. face. They want to like, yeah, they want to lose face. I know, I know jiu-jitsu coaches like that. They only let their guys who want to compete, they got to like go under, go under them where I'm like, man, go compete. Go out there and get the experience. Well, mate, with jiu-jitsu, I'm all about the guys competing. You know, I think it's probably, and that's one of the first things I tell them, you know, if they want to compete, I always say, 
you know, go out and do a couple of jujitsu contests and get those little butterflies out. You know, at least you can tap there, you know what I mean? I mean, you can get seriously hurt, obviously, but if you're smart about it, you feel uncomfortable, you tap, you can come back the next day and play again, you know? Um, and, and, and it's a good way of, you know, getting that adrenaline, you know, where you're in front of the crowd, you know, the other guy wants to get you as much as you want to get him <clears throat> without the, the fear of getting punched in the head a few times, you know? <clears throat> Yeah, that's a great yeah, that's a good idea. Anytime somebody wants to compete, just tell them, hey, yeah, look, I understand you want to fight. Okay, but you got to crawl before you walk. Do some jujitsu. Let's see how it is when the only thing is on the line is you get choked or you can tap. And then if it gets crazy, you can always tap out and you don't get, you know, punched down, punched out bad, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and to me, I always tell the guys too, if you, if you want to get better at jujitsu, if you go into a comp, you've got a goal. You're probably going to get show up to training a lot more often. You're probably going to eat better, and, and your your progress in your journey to jujitsu is going to you, you're going to jump up ahead leaps and bounds just because you're you're going to compete. You know, um, and, and same as MMA. You know, if you, if you start competing on a regular basis, you your whole game gets better because you're there more often. You know, if you're there just and there's nothing wrong with people coming in and just doing it to get fit, you know, because they've got family or they're working or whatever. There's nothing wrong with that, you know, because sometimes these guys are – I've got guys like that that are probably some of the best guys around, but they just don't want to compete. Yeah. <clears throat> they just like the whole journey of it, you know, and I've seen them at a lot of gyms, you know. They, they don't, they've got no thing to complete, uh, compete, but – you know, on the mats or, you know, in, in the cage, they're just, they're just beasts, you know, and you go, geez, you could go a long way if you really wanted to get to that next level, but they're, they're happy just to show up and be a body for all the other guys, you know? I meet a lot of guys like that. So that's so true, man. We had this one guy in our home gym here in Miami. We call him the Godfather. He's like 42 years old. He, well, no, back then he was 42. He's a lot older now, you know, but man, he was the oldest guy in our crew, had like a family, had three kids. At the time, his wife was pregnant with his with his youngest daughter. And this guy was like a was a big manager of a huge department store, had like 50 employees working for him. And this guy would still come to the gym. And I seen this guy like break UFC fighters, like just the last one standing. It's like, man, super motivational, you know, like in his late for like into his 40s. He's just one of those workhorses in the gym that you're thinking, man, this guy. And they just they love to they just love to get at it and grind. Right. 100 percent, you know. And, and they're, they're the guys that make the team as well, you know, because, you know, they're, they're not doing it for the accolades or anything. They just do it because, you know, they're martial artists and they love the, they love the sport. Yeah, that's, I love that. I, mean, I love that part of small gyms when they have that. Like, I love the small gyms. I have that small group of core guys. And you have, like, the guy who's an accountant. This guy's a construct. That's a, CKB has those vibes where in CKB you'll have a random guy, just a regular plumber, you know, but he's just in there. He's in there sparring with Israel, you know, and, and big-ass Kiwi, you know, sparring with Israel and all these boys on the weekends. <laughs> you know, and, and that, that's what I'm sort of saying. We've got the, the same thing at, at our gym, you know, where – you got guys there that are just casuals, but man, they 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 you know they're, they're good training partners. You know they they take it up. Yeah. And you go shit. If you really wanted to take this seriously, you could go somewhere, but they're not interested there. They've got other goals and motivations in their life, but you know. That's good on how to. Yeah, man. Hey, you remember when Volt came in? Was did he come in pretty casually? He was just looking to get after it, or what was? You remember when Volt came in? How was his when he, when you met him in the gym? Yeah, well, Volk just came in to get, you know, uh, fit for, you know, um, the football season. It's probably like around this time of year, you know, like the start of the new year. You know, he wanted to, you know, probably had a good Christmas and New Year and, you know, wanted to get a little <laughs> bit for his football season, you know. He says he was 98. I reckon he was about 110. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only 98. And, but, oh, uh, yeah, he, like, he, he was just a... Uh, a regular guy that came in and yeah you know, he, he and look at him now <laughs> man he was doing something he was just a concreter footballer and now look at him and he had to when he was concreting he had he even went in the ufc he had to, he was still working a little bit when he was still in the ufc at one point right yeah he was just doing a day here and there but a lot of these guys have to you know yeah like, man but like, uh, people getting a uh, an illusion that if once you get into the UFC, you know, they, they've got, you've got Ferraris thrown at you and all this and all that, 
you know, a lot of these guys, you know, they're, they're, they're doing it tough, you know, it's so tough, you know. The money isn't as good and they just got to keep grinding, you know. Um, you know. Hopefully they keep winning. If you lose, you only get half your money. If you win, you, you double your money. Uh, you know, if you get if you fight at your your first three fights, you know you'll probably get a, you know, your, your pay will increase. But, you know, the more you win, the more you you climb the ladder, and the more you you get put. You know, taking the short notice fights always get you big bucks. You know, um, the short um, notice gets you the that, money, huh? Sorry, the short notice will get you big, will get you more money in there, huh? Yeah. Obviously, you know, they need you, so you obviously you can negotiate a better uh, contract, you know. Um, that's just the way it is, you know, where a lot of the other times you, yeah, you know, you're, you're signed up for this, you know, but, you know, you they want you to fight somebody else. Well, it's bad luck, you know, you you take it or you leave it. Yeah, definitely. You know, what I was, that's what I was thinking. That's one of the things that I would like to definitely, one of the, a few, there's a bunch of things I would love to change going back on my career, but one of the things even going forward and for the guys that I coach and corner and bring up, um, being smart with the fight with your money and, and getting paid, you know, like thinking of yourself as a business and taking your money more seriously so that you can really, when this is over, because this can happen, it, yeah, you guys, how many how many fighters are so, um, don't have that that uh, knowledge with the with the money handling, you know, like how many people, like you get these savage fighters and you give them a couple paychecks and I can only imagine, I, I, can't, I can't be the only one that, you know what I'm saying, made some terrible oh, choices. Oh, 100%, you know, I, I think even at the highest level, you know, uh, a lot of them, you know, and, and sometimes when they get to the highest level very quickly when they're young, they, you know, they think that it's never going to end. And like I said to you at the beginning, you know, you've only got this small window to make all your money and you can't go and blow it. You, you really got to go and invest it, you know, and, you know, and, and, and do other things too, you know, like, you know, today, you know, social media is such a big thing, uh, and, you know, and that can bring you in sponsors and people to, uh, to you know, to, to, you know, to help you um, live while you're fighting, you know, and, uh, if you can get somebody to pay for you to train full time and then you get your fight money and you just put that in the bank, you know, you know, after a few fights, you know, maybe you can buy yourself a house, you know, uh, depending on which shows you're on, obviously. But um, th that's the key. And I always say that to people, I go, you know, to all the fighters, I always tell them, save your money, you know, don't go and blow it, you know. Uh, if you need a car or you need this, you know, don't, don't go buy yourself a uh, you know, a high-end car, just buy yourself a normal run-around car that's cheap to run and is going to be reliable. And then when you do make it, then buy yourself a car. But if you buy yourself a high-end car and you're paying it off, you're always going to be behind the eight ball, you know. If you save your money and, you know, invest in property or shares or something like that, you know, when you get older and you retire, at least you've got something to fall back on, you know. You haven't – because a lot of these guys, you know, they're, they're – Unless you're educating yourself or you're good on social media or or you're doing something, you know, or you've got a trade or you've studied, what are you going to do when you leave, you know? Are you just going to be continually getting beat up, you know, and then you become one of these, you still see them around, you know, that uh, have been fighting forever and they still have to fight, you know, because they've got no money, you know? That's what it is. They're taking fights for the money. That's the, that's the, ah, that's the one it's, the, it's almost like the good and bad of being a fighter because then you're like, hey, I can just do what I do best and get paid for it. But then it's like, damn, at one point you don't want to be fighting. You don't want to see these guys all gray and old. I didn't even know Shogun was fighting yesterday. I thought he yeah. was at the card for like – I thought he when somebody said Shogun, I thought he was there signing autographs. I can't believe he still fought. That's crazy, you know. Like that's got to be for the cash or you think he, that guy just loves it, you know. Yeah, who knows? He's been in the game for a long time. Yeah. And it's horrible – over, you know, um, where you know, watching them get, you know, beat up like they did, you know, you, I'm, I'm so glad that Glover put the gloves up, and I hope he never goes back because I think he's just too tough for his own good. That fight was crazy. And, I was screaming, "Stop that fight!" like five times yesterday. Yeah, and like I know the ref wanted to stop it, but he couldn't because, like again, you know, Glover looked like he was, you know, hanging by a string, and then he'd just pull himself back up and get back in the game again, and. You know, I mean, it looks great for the fans, but, you know, as a coach and and everything else, I, I, honestly, I, it, it, I don't like it, you know. I, uh, 
I, I think there's sometimes these guys need to be protected from themselves because they're too tough for their own good. Yeah, would you yeah. let him go out in the fifth round like that? Have you? I, I feel like, how would you feel about stopping a fight if you had to? Would you you would feel comfortable stopping a fight for your athlete? I would. But you, look, at, again, you, you've got to know your athlete. You know what I mean? Yeah. You've got to know your athlete, you know. I, I think yeah, if you stop guy over guy, would probably come out and punch you out, you know, because you stopped him. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, right? It's tough. Yeah. It's tough to you, stop these guys. He, he wasn't looking for a way out, you know. He just he's just a, a fighter's fighter. But again, he's not doing himself any, any favors, you know. Uh, he, I mean, look, a lot of it was probably superficial. He's probably got, you know, he's probably got a bad headache today. But man, he caught some big hits, you know. Yeah. But he just kept coming back, you know. And, and some guys are built different, you know. They can take it, you know. Their skulls are probably a bit thicker, and yeah, that I don't know, you know. It's a tough one. That's a tough one. And a lot of times, especially with fighters, you know, like our, our sometimes our best attribute is also our sometimes your biggest weakness because it's, it's your heart and your willpower. And sometimes that can be your downfall, especially in fighting. 100%. How good, man. Yeah. Hey, you, even have, you haven't had to worry about that with Volk, man. The smartest, maybe the smartest, I reckon the smartest fight IQ in the UFC in the game right now. You're talking about a guy who... Man, in his last four fights, we're talking about little to no. I mean, besides his hands throwing those throwing those haymakers on these big ass heads, besides his hands, you know, like he's been pretty, he's been out of the uh, out of out of harm's danger for for quite a while in the UFC, man. Touch wood, yeah. He, um, yeah. I mean, it, it's sort of what what uh, my philosophy in fighting is, and I mean, it's nothing new. It's been around forever. Is you want to hit him. With a punch where he can't hit you or the strike you know you want to strike him where he can't hit you back you know and, and you know like props up to these guys who stand there and bang but for me that's not fighting I, I i want my boys to hit them and then not get really hit you know uh, and that's something i just push in day in day out with the guys you know um you know it's um yeah, I was gonna yeah, ask if that's something that you if that's something you drill into the boys at freestyle that because I see with Volk and all your guys they're all clean with it. Nobody in there is really taking any. Even um, you know who I've been seeing that's been looking really good, man. Uh, James Malarkey, where he's has he been training with you guys quite for he does most of his camps with you now. Yeah, yeah, he, you know, he, he does most of his camp with us, and and you know, he does a bit with Ross. Ross comes down too. You know, Ross Pearson is a legend of the sport too. Yeah, yeah, um, man. Jamie's a, you know, Jamie's a good guy. Again, he's he's a guy you can hit him with a brick, you know, and he'll just keep walking forward, you know. Yeah, he's got um, that yeah. natural toughness, but since but I've seen a lot of improvements since he's been working with you guys, you know, working with the champ too. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, that's the big thing I say to Jamie, man. Well, you know, it's it's great that you can take it, but do you need to? You know, yeah. uh, you can get in and then get back out, reset yourself, and then go again. You know, I mean, if you look at Jamie's earlier fights, they were all blood baths, you know. Um, where now, um, you know, he, he's become a lot better. He's a lot more technical, you know, and he wants to improve, you know, and that's power to him, you know. I, I always say if someone wants to improve, you know, they're the best guys on earth, you know. They, they want to get better. They don't think they know it all. And, yeah, he's, he is getting better. Boom. Perfect. Good way to close it out. This is a good way to close it out. So, Big Joe. For you got a lot of guys looking up to Alex Volkanovski. You got the number one pound for pound goat with you from the beginning. You got a lot of up and comers in the gym. What qualities do you look for in an athlete that wants to go to freestyle fighting gym and they want to prove to you that they got what it takes? What's some of the, what's some characteristics you look in an athlete that wants to go into this sport and get after it? Uh, look, the first thing is that they want to be there, you know, and put the time into it. You know, if you want to come there, and, you know, twice a week to get fit. Yeah, that's good for you. If you want to be a fighter, you've got to put the time in on the mats. You know, there's no ifs or buts about it. You've got to put the work in. If you don't put the work in, you're not going to get the results. And that's what I said about earlier where I've got some guys that, you know, they're not athletically gifted or, you know, they might be a bit unco and you think, Jesus, you know, you, I hate to see you get hurt, but they've got the tenacity to show up day in, day out, morning sessions, evening sessions. You've got to give them the chance, you know, and that, that's the main thing I, I look at, you know. And then obviously for the, the higher level guys that want to make it into the big show, you know, they, they, they've got to have some sort of, you know, they've got to be technical. They've got to want to know how to listen, you know. They, they can't be know-it-alls. Uh, even I don't know it all, you know. I'm always asking questions and I'm always, you know, 
trying to learn something new. I'm watching stuff all the time. If I don't, I think I'm, I'm the one that's going to be left behind, you know. And, you know, it's always great like to have Frankie here, Craig, Brad, you know, even Hugh Jean. I learn off all these guys, you know, and I only learn by asking questions, watching, and and, and that that that's such a big thing, you know, uh, for fighters that, that they can't have, can't stop that hunger to want to learn, you know. And then if you're tough and you're fit, mate, you're you're on your road. Yeah, there you go. They and then you're already halfway there. And then once they step into the door, they're going to be in the right hands, baby. They're going to be with the master splinter, ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, so I know you guys have got a lot going on. What's your predictions? How do we how do we get predictions without saying too much for the fight against for your for our for our double title? How man, Australia is going to be so crazy, me. man. No predictions. What do you no guys? Anything specific you guys are focusing on for Islam right now, or just getting after it? Yeah, look, we're. Like I say, with every fight, we're not worried. Look, we know what Islam's good at and what he's going to do, but we're going out there to make Islam worried about what we're doing to him. You know, you know, if um, Alex plays his game, you know, uh, Islam's not going to know if Alex is moving left or he's moving right, and the next minute he's getting hit here and he's getting hit there. And if we get taken down, which we expect to, we're going to get back up. You know, that's, uh, you know, we've been drilling it over and over and over. You know, we're, we're not we're not scared of being taken down. We're not worried about it. We expect to be taken down. It's a matter of can he hold him down, you know, and that's going to be the big test, you know. I highly doubt it. We can't. Hey, there's a lot of, they got to show us. They got to, they got to show, they get, we got to see it to believe it, man, because from what I'm hearing on the streets, ain't nobody holding that man down. <laughs> Hard to hold down. Yeah, he is very hard. I, I, I just hope Islam wants to engage a little bit and just doesn't want to turn it into a hanging on competition, you know. Oh, we just and got him pressed up. Yeah. Uh, but again, you know, uh, the way Alex has been looking at the, what he's been doing to guys, I think it's going to be very hard for Islam to play that game on Alex, you know. He's... Yeah, yeah, he's he's. I've seen him lift up to a different level this camp. You know, um, he's gonna just be the so way he, fast. I cannot, I cannot imagine how fast he's gonna be, and especially at one fifty five, he looks so fast against against uh, in the Korean Zombie. He looks so fast, and his turnaround was quick. And I remember me and Shay were like, "Man, that was a quick turnaround." How did you feel about that turnaround with the uh, Korean Zombie and Holloway? It was pretty quick, huh? Yeah, yeah, it was, but it was good because, you know, Alex didn't really get hurt at all and uh, we were just ready to go, you know, we just jumped on. I think he had, uh, he hurt something, it wasn't ma major and we just got over it and then we just jumped back in. It was good for me because I, I like when it's back-to-back -back camps, you know, my, my body takes it a lot better. Um, as uh, you know, it just kicks so you can stay in, You stay in rhythm, and, you stay in rhythm. Yeah, yeah. It's and, nice not and, to get look, kicked for six months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, then I really feel it. But um, <laughs> yeah, now, um, yeah, one of probably Alex's best, or he, two things that Alex has got really good. He's got really good timing, and he's got really good distance management. He uh, he understands the distance, and I, I said that to him from day one about his distance. You know, a, a lot of guys, even at high level, don't understand distance. He he's he he's had that gift from day one when. I first started holding pads for him and I was moving around with him. He understood distance, you know, and that, and that makes it so hard for people because he he's always just out of your range. So it gives him that little buffer where he can hit you and you can't hit him, you know? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited, man. Yeah, his sense of distance is crazy. And, uh, and he also had that, like, world class. Who would have known that rugby is such a great translation for MMA, right? Like, man, has any other rugby players thought about transitioning? Or do you know any other rugby players that are fighting right now? Uh, look, a, a lot of them have over the years, you know. I mean, Tai Tuivasa was a high-level. Oh, he was? Uh, you know, he, yeah, yeah. You know, Mark Hunt was one. You know, I mean, I don't think Mark Hunt used to just play. Uh, a, a lot of them, you know. It, I mean, it's... Um, I guess like you guys, you know, play the football. Uh, yeah, your football. All of us play that when we're kids. You know what I mean? Some take it longer and further. You know, like Alex. I mean, tied to with us, was you know was signed up to one of the the, the NFL teams. You know, um, so that, that that's the top of the. You know, you can't get better than that. Oh wow! And, I didn't know and, that. 
and he, he actually left that to, to fight MMA because he, he loved hitting people more than he did tackling them, you know? Wow. Yeah. Oh, man, they got the undercard. They got, oh, what's good about the Australia card, they got Yair and Emmett. I saw that on the co-main event. Yeah. That's going to be a good fight. Now, finally, you think that will be a number one contender for Alex? Do you think that, sh that fight will separate a number one contender? Well, he's going to be the interim champion, so... It, it's um oh i didn't see that i'm sorry that's a title fight that's an interim title fight yeah it's an interim title fight so oh 100 you know, after that fight we've got like a we've got a direction it's either going to be josh or yair you know which is which is really good because you know the last you know the last year two years it's just been hard because there's only been max a lot of these guys have been taken you know trying to pad their records and not put themselves out there you know hoping that you know, hey, I'm here, you need to fight me, you know, and, you know, these guys are stepping up and power to them. Um, and, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, you know. Um, it's going to be a hard one. I'm, I like both those guys. They're both pretty talented and uh, it's going to be a good fight, I think. Yeah, I think more marketable fight would be a year for the pay-per-views. I reckon with the Mexican, Mexico versus Australia, you get a real classic Mexico versus Australia rivalry. You don't see that one often. Now we got to make that happen just for the just for the country, just for the continents. You know what I'm saying? Oh, uh, <laughs> look, we, we had that with Ortega. <laughs> What's I'm sorry? We had it with Ortega. In oh, the that's sense. right, that's right. Yeah, but Ortega's like a Me American Mexican. You know, is he real? Me I don't think he's real Mexican. Oh, no, he's no. is Mexican, Mexican too. Actually, yeah, I think they're both yeah. the same. You're right. <laughs> yeah, uh, out of all the UFC fights I've had, that Ortega fight, the, I've ne the crowd was the loudest I've ever heard any crowd. In Vegas? In Vegas, yes. There's a lot of Mexican I mean, people in Vegas. Australia's always crazy, um, but somehow you can still I, 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 you can still hear the corners. That fight, Alex could not hear us, you know what I mean? He could not hear us, the crowd was just chanting the whole fight you know it was uh it was a bit surreal yeah wow and that was just that was like one of the first big show crowds right with from the pandemics like because i remember i leaving thailand and it was still locked down yeah yeah that's probably why too you know everyone was a bit fucking crazy about getting out there and uh watching live fights but it was um yeah that's one of the loudest crowds especially in uh you know mobile t arena that was yeah man joe that was crazy you guys are so lucky that you're going to be fighting in Australia that you don't have to go to Vegas, bro. When me and Shay were in the stands in the Holloway fight, I don't know what these people, the people that go to fights in Vegas, man. <laughs> this is not the best representation of my country. I'm just telling you right now, I apologize. <laughs> really, I've never, been, I've never been in the crowd, so I don't know, but uh, Mate, I love that. It the was wild. Talk. Vegas is a place, bro. I left a piece of my soul there, uh, uh, Joe. <laughs> I think <laughs> I shaved it's my beard great. when I left the hotel. I shaved my beard so they wouldn't recognize me on the way out. <laughs> That's um, bad. <laughs> hey, Joe, I really appreciate you taking the time, man. I was only going to do 30 minutes. We're already almost up to an hour, man, where I can go here talking to you for days. Hey, well, I'm All really right. excited to see you take out the okay. champ. You guys are going to take out the lightweight champ. Next time I talk to you, you're going to be having two belts. Oh, man. And nobody deserves it more, Joe. I really appreciate it, man. You guys have a great training and a great week, man. Enjoy the rest of the fight camp. Okay. Thanks, Emily. Thanks for having me on, mate. Hey, Big Joe. Always much love, my brother. Be safe, my man. Yeah.